every day you read about deals which don't happen. I mean, you look at uh, you know transactions uh, where shareholders are supportive, uh, the acquirer is prepared to pay a big premium. In fact, many of these deals are stock deals where the shareholders get to continue in the value creation, and a board rejects it, uh, and they don't happen, and the acquiring company you know walks away having spent. $100 million, $200 million when you consider all the financing right. commitments and everything they need to get. I mean, wh what we did in Allergan is we, we called the question and allowed shareholders to decide what they wanted to do with the future of their business. And I think that uh, there are acquirers who would like to, you know, companies that would like to buy. There are transactions that don't happen for social issues that I think we can help catalyze. So I think it's very likely we will partner with another strategic uh, to make a bid for a business. And we may not get it, um, but, you know, if the outcome right. for shareholders is the business either improves on its own or it gets sold to someone else, I think that's a win. Um, those were great returns. This summer has not been great for you, nor has it had sure. been for most of the hedge fund industry. Um, and last year was, you had huge returns. Mm -hmm. What does the end of the year look like for you? And what do you think it's gonna look like for people in your business? And, and if, it, if it turns out to be negative, what do you think it does to the business? Sure. Look, I, I think you know, people call us a hedge fund and they call the whole category. I mean, I think what we, we need to do a few things. One is, from an industry perspective, we need to explain a little bit better about what a hedge fund is. Now, there are some funds that are designed to not lose money almost in any market condition. There's, you know, call it market neutral. Now, I, I think there are very few that actually work, but there's some that are successful in that model. And a down 7% month for a market neutral fund is like a disaster. We're really principally a long only fund with the exception of Herbalife. We own concentrated positions in companies. We own them for years. Uh, you know, CP we've owned, right. you know, for four years, we'll probably own it for, for many more years. Howard Hughes we've effectively owned for seven years. Um, so we don't, I can't tell you where any of our stocks are gonna be next month. I mean, it's, you know, certainly, I can't even tell you where they're going to be at the end of the year. What I can tell you is that the businesses we own, Mondelez will be a much more valuable company, you know, a year from now than it is today. And two years from now, it's going to be even more valuable. And CP is going to be a much more valuable company. What's interesting about a company like CP, you know, stock price moves up and down based on oil prices and commodity prices. But if you, what is the value of a business? It's the present value of the cash the business generates over the, over its life. You know, the, the price of oil in the short term doesn't have a particularly meaningful impact on that calculation, but it seems to have a big impact on the stock price. So volatility is an opportunity for long-term investors to buy more at attractive prices, or in the case of CP, they're buying more of the company. Bill, I almost feel like you're a split personality. On, on the one hand, you are a long-term investor. On the sure. other hand, you are a big activist. So like, where, what do you can think of yourself as? Uh, I mean, activists are long-term investors. I mean, the, the Not all of them. Not all of them. I'd look, again, I think there's a spectrum. It's just like hedge fund managers, mutual fund managers. What we do is, uh, you know, 10 years ago, people accused us of being short-term. Well, we had been in business for a year. It's hard to prove that we're a long-term investor. Um, you know, the, when you're moving around $20 billion, it's hard to do that constantly buying and selling things. You're much better off buying super high-quality companies and making them better. I think the most important thing about this article is he basically says, uh, short sellers who share their views publicly, there's something very wrong with that. Uh, it's effectively, as you say, a hedge fund b becoming a private regulator. As opposed to people talking up stocks that they own positions. Right. In. That's right. And I think that uh, is, is absurd, right? Look at lumber liquidators. I'll take myself out of it, right? So Whitney Tilson goes public maybe a year ago and says this company is shipping formaldehyde-laced product that can cause cancer and harm, ignored by the markets. Uh, it took a... a uh, a 60 Minutes piece, uh, which Whitney obviously was uh, the protagonist in, uh, but they did their own research as well to ultimately alert the world. Stock went from over $100 a share to today it's 15. The company's been forced to withdraw this product. They're under investigation by a whole bunch of regulators. I think the consumers have benefited. The shareholders who sold when they when Whitney went out with his piece have been right. big beneficiaries. Look at David Einhorn and Lehman. Right, He came public and said this company's undercapitalized. They need to recapitalize. Uh, Lehman ignored him. Yeah, I think they continued to buy back stock. You know, they said David was market manipulation, I think was the word that was used. Well, had the company recapitalized, Lehman might have made it through the financial crisis. Shareholders might have gotten something out of their investment. Uh, and Lehman, look at Jim Chanos on Enron. So I, I think that, you know, and then he's, what's interesting in the article, and again, there are lots of factual problems with the article, which, which we can address, but the this is an inherently healthy phenomenon. What, what's interesting about the article is the last sentence he talks about, is it right for sort of hedge fund managers operating behind closed doors in private meetings? You know, we, there's nothing closed door or private about our investment in herb life, right? We gave the most public, most transparent presentation, 350 slides with multiple right. presentations. We have a website with every piece of research we've done, plus all the source documents. Yeah, isn't that an incredibly healthy thing 
you know, for market transparency. Um, so I think it's uh, I really disagree. Uh, you know, reporters can write whatever they want to write. I respect that. You know, for someone who spent clearly an enormous amount of time, 12,000 word article, to come to, I, I think, an absurd conclusion, uh, disappointment. Only, I'll give you a little fun fact which might help people discern this company is operating fraudulently. So among the facts that he reports in the story, he says Herbalife is running uh, 101 orphanages in 51 countries around the world. Now, the only place for him to get that fact was from Herbalife. Herbalife has something called Casa Herbalife, and it's sort of their philanthropy. What it is, is they give a blender or two to a children's organization in the country. And they sh this product they can't, that distributors can't sell, they check a box and Herbalife donates the product to these 101 little places around the world. And it's fed to small children. Now, I, I, I don't know whether small children in Africa should be drinking this uh, you know, protein shake from Herbalife. Right. That, that's a medical question. But the notion that they're running orphanages, uh, you know, I just think that if I were a reporter, I would focus on that. I'd go go into these Casa Herbalife. I do it. I wouldn't ask for Herbalife to tell me right. the, where the model ones are located. But I, I'd go see that one. Uh, I think it's more a tax fraud than uh, for distributors than it is helping.